back to my next guest, psychologist and geopolitical analyst, Sam Vaknin. Um, and, and the headline that um, I've got to work with here is, if you refuse to listen to people's grievances and stigmatise them, they turn to Hamas, they turn to Hitler, and they turn to Trump. Um, to explain more about this, and this is in the light of the, the, the riots and some of the things that we've seen happening, Sam Vaknin, um, a professor of clinical psychology, and as I said before, a geopolitical analyst, joins me now. Sam, you know, and I... I, I, I hope that I continue to learn and I, I certainly learn from you. So I did a little bit of, of research of reminding myself of Germany, 1920s, 1930s, of course there's a Wall Street uh, crash of 1929, Germany had to repay all of that money, they couldn't, things got worse and worse and worse, you had a government uh, that was either far right or sort of Marxist or communist left, polarisation of goodies and baddies and what have you, they needed a bad guy, I mean the, 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 the people were going hungry, people were starving and I was re reminded, looking at what you said, a friend of mine at school, her mother was German and she said she'd been part of the Hitler Youth. I, I started high school in 1969 and I was absolutely shocked. And she said they didn't know what it was then, it, you know, pre-war. They didn't have food. She said we didn't even have shoes on our feet. And they took all these children to a place uh, from, I don't know, some city to um, Saxon House, where I've been. It's a really beautiful area. They fed us, they gave us food and what have you. And we listened to them. And their message was, under them, they'd get rid of these people who were taking their money. They would make the economy. But I was reading through what they were saying and I was like, in hello, you still got politicians saying the same thing. So just talk us through. And I, I mean, no one was listening to the German people and into that void came the Nazis. Yes, good to see you again, uh, Trisha. In the Bible it says, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. And I, I might add there's nothing new under the moon from personal experience. But there's really nothing new. Anti-immigration movements, for example, they're not new. Anti-Semitism is an anti-immigration movement mm. because when the Jews were expelled from Judea by the Romans, they became immigrants mm. in many countries. So here we have anti-Semitism. Racism is an anti-immigration movement because people from Africa were forcibly moved to other countries. They became essentially immigrants. Refugees are immigrants. So anti-immigration, the hatred of the other is nothing new. Nazism that you've mentioned in the 1920s and 1930s was the epitome and culmination of this, but it was nothing new. Mm. I think what we are seeing today is actually new. And it is new because the motivating force is the discrepancy, the abyss between what we call the overt text and the hidden text, the covert text. Mm. Now, what is, what is the overt text? The overt text in the West is multiculturalism, mm. to tolerance, pluralism. That is the overt text. But what is the real text? What hides underneath? What is the unseemly underbelly of the overt text, the covert text? It is haughty, arrogant elitism. Ah. It is a sin. You know, so, uh, so I'm just, uh, and, and you've brought in something, and you know, I thought in this whole discussion, the one thing, especially in Britain, especially in Britain, that hasn't been talked about, is a class divide. There I'm is definitely, to, definitely yeah. a class divide in what was yes. is going on. I'm about to mention it. Mm. So haughty, arrogant elitism, of course, has to do with, with classes. Mm. I'll come to it in a minute. Mm. The, the, another element of the hidden text, which is the only real text, by the way, mm. the overt text is never real. Only the hidden text is real. We know it from Derrida and other mm. scholars. So. Another element is losses, losses, losses of real losses and imagined losses of privilege, of hegemony, of exclusivity, of a way of life, of values, and ultimately of a sense of safety. 
people feel that they have lost all these. Now, who are these people that I'm talking about? I call them the invisible class. Ah. There is there is the elite class and the invisible class. And the invi- invisible class is comprised of the youth. Mm. The youth in today's world is utterly hopeless economically, spiritually, psychologically. The youth is in a disastrous state. Uh, men, men mm. who are losing the battle against women, women are far more educated, far more socially mobile and so on and so forth. Working class whites, working class whites mm. in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in many other countries, who are losing out to globalization and automation. Yeah. And finally, the, finally, the less educated people with a high school diploma and so on, mm. who are not competitive in the current workplace environment. So these are these people are forgotten. They're ignored. They're overlooked. No one listens to them. No one talks to them. No one sees them. They are the invisible class. There is no structure. There is no institution which caters explicitly and exclusively to the needs of the invisible class. Mm. Until, though, I was going to say, it's, uh, and into that void and coming back to like the 1920s and the 1930s, that creates a ripe um, ground. Uh, and it's interesting, again, going back to my history lesson, it was interesting to see that the uh, Hitler was backed by uh, elite the ones who had money. They thought, well, we'll let this guy speaking all this rubbish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll let him in. And then when he's in, we'll get rid of him and we'll have power back again. It reminds me of uh, the Republican Party and what's happening with Trump. Um, And in every case, these people who come into, you said the invisible classes, but the people who end up saying, we know what we can do. We'll take it in charge. I'm thinking of your Nigel Farage's uh, or anyone like that, your Trumps. They're billionaires, they're multimillionaires. They're not part of the invisible class, but they are the ones who offer salvation. This has to do with the fact that they are terrified. They're in panic. They are able to read the, the cards and the runes. You know, they've become billionaires because they're very good at spotting trends. And they see the growing social unrest. They see the disintegration of the social fabric. They see the imminent threat of a revolution or a rebellion. There's a lot of defiance, a lot of aggression, a lot of violence. And what they do, what they, what they try to do, is create a um, steam valve, a pressure valve. Create, find a demagogue mm. or find, uh, uh, find a political party who are willing to espouse the contents or to make the contents of the hidden text explicit. And so they talk about the losses, they talk about the discrimination, and they talk about the, and so on and so forth. Mm. The grievances of the invisible class become a political platform. And the elites believe that they can puppeteer, that they're puppet masters. Yes. They They can, through this pressure valve, they can get rid of the risk of social unrest. That is, of course, nonsense, Mm. because history has proven repeatedly. Adolf Hitler is an excellent example. Mm. I think Donald Trump is another. No comparison, by the way. No, 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 no. But in in the way that they uh, they can come in, they can, as you say, and I I, I love the way you put that, they can spot a trend. After all, they're businessmen. Um, So it's not about them even believing what they're saying. They will say what they need to say to increase their empire, to get their power. And because people are so desperate, because you keep hearing people make the same excuses for maybe a Donald Trump-like figure or Nigel Farage or what have you, this Tommy Robinson, whatever his name is, who's sunning himself and tweeting all sorts of misinformation. The Elon Musks, who've got billions, uh, the people behind Telegram, billions as well and people even though you, you sort of think can't you see you are ka-ching ka-ching for them can't you see can't you say they'll say oh it's not tommy robertson's fault that he's lying there on a beach it's not donald trump so he's got millions and millions he's he's one of us when they couldn't they don't care about it but they've seen an opportunity it's a faustian deal 
the the elites the elites allow the invisible class to express and manifest its grievances they believe that talking about the grievances would make them go away mm. definitely would would undermine or undercut the incipient social unrest. And so, as I said, they regard it as a pressure valve to release steam, mm. you know. So that's the elites. The invisible class believe that if they were to team up with movers and shakers and multi-billionaires and yes. so forth, ultimately they will come to power and they will be they will become or they will regain dominance, hegemony, the economic benefits, mm. social benefits, they will impose their values on society, and they don't mind if it's not done in a democratic way, because democracy has never worked for the invisible yeah, class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Liberal so, democracy so, has failed so, so, by alienating... Yeah, I was going to say, so, so yeah. when, if those, uh, you know, movers and shakers and billionaires get power either through democracy or saying that the, the re election was rigged or however they do it um and you know do those the unsight the the unseen the invisible do they ever get to have their dreams realized all of these people with all of these millions he's one of us even though he's got billions and lives in a golden tower or is a millionaire and everything and if we hang on to his coattails we too will be powerful does it ever actually materialize because it figures to be once those people get in power um, and, and different situations. It could be in a very extreme um, with Hitler. It could be in, you know, a, a Trump or an Elon Musk or any of those. Once they get into power, they don't need those invisible classes again. It's like Animal Farm, doesn't it? Start all over again. Everyone holds the invisible class in contempt. That's the truth. That's the elitist poison has permeated every social cell, universal higher education. Business, everyone holds the invisible class in contempt. At best, they are considered to be low level, low intensity consumers. Mm. That's the best case scenario. So, of course, no one is going to pay attention to their grievances or gratify their, their hopes and dreams or meet their expectations. Of course not. They're cast aside. So, Maybe even, so Sam, just to come back, so even if you're these people who offer salvation, I'm your voice. Um, this is my party. It's a different party. We're, we're going to make things better for you. Even if they do get into power, it's not going to change anything for no. those that. And so they stay there until another Donald Trump or Nigel Farage or whoever comes along. And then yes. it happens all over again. I regard the invisible class as the dynamo of politics. The invisible class is creates sufficient, a sufficient amount of unrest to change the regime, basically. Mm. Not to change a political party, but to change the structure of the regime. So it is the invisible class that drives everything, mm. but it is hijacked continuously by intellectuals, for example, in the Russian Revolution, yeah. or by industrialists, for example, in Germany, mm. Nazi Germany, or by rich billionaires, for example, in the United States today. Right. The agenda, the agenda of the invisible class is always compromised by the fact that the invisible class doesn't have a sufficient number of intellectuals, doesn't have enough money, doesn't know to organize itself. Social media has changed it to some extent, mm -hmm. but not to a large extent. Okay, so, um, so let's take a break because uh, I want to come back. Uh, and and talk more about this because what is interesting to me as well is on the other flip side what we've seen happening here in the UK when this whole previously silent uh, lot of people start taking to the streets in an altogether different way of protesting what's going on there we'll be back with more with Sam Vaknin right after this break <laughs>
commander in chief can't even survive cutting himself shaving, and the man that we weren't sure about has just survived a bullet. That's America, right? I mean, it's, it's no, no, it's responding. It was great. We've got to call out the champagne socialist. Do you know what I mean? The thing is, what, what's happened in this country, yeah, do you know what I mean? It, you know, we've been infiltrated, really. And I'm sorry, but someone has to say this and properly say it, do you know what I mean? But the thing is, though, if, if anyone speaks out against what's actually going on in the country, like, do you know what I mean? How many times do you think you said, do you know what I mean? No, 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 no,
This kind of violence undermines norms, societal norms and societal mores. It is, it is non-normative. It creates something called anomie, mm. a, a society or an environment which has no norms of behavior. Mm. You do, in other words, you don't know any, any longer what's right and what's wrong. Right, yeah, yeah. But you shouldn't do. Number two, it undermines the communal identity. Mm. It undermines the community's identity. What is a community? A community is a narrative. It's a story. It's something we all believe in because it's, you know, it's shared. So it's a narrative. And this kind of violence undermines the narrative, destroys it, tears it apart, yeah. rends, rends the social fabric apart. Mm -hmm. Number three, um, it has a major impact on what we call social cohesion. Yeah. Social cohesion includes consensus, a social consensus and social solidarity. And so with faced with such violence, the consensus disintegrates mm. and solidarity vanishes in most cases. Mm. So there's a structural effect. Number and, four. And, and I was going to say as well, Sam, there's that all the normal things you did um, would suddenly become scary. I mean, people who probably never thought of sending the kids down to the corner shop, you know, just normal everyday things suddenly become, you know, frightening. Unsafe. Yeah, unsafe. 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 That's the word. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what I mentioned. Yeah. That's what I yeah. mentioned before the break. Yeah. There's, a, a, there's a dissipation of the sense of safety. Yeah. You no longer feel safe because you no longer know what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. What are the norms? What's the narrative? Is there a consensus? Is there solidarity? Mm. Your own neighbors suddenly appear to be alien, strange from it's it's a jungle kind of thing. It's, it, it's each one on his own, you know. And um, the next thing, number four, is functionality. Of course, such violence affects the functioning of the community. Mm. Stores, stores and schools close down. The police enters. I mean, so functionality and efficacy of the community is damaged. And finally, as you said, the sense of safety, and it creates a flight or fight response. People either avoid the situation altogether, mm. barricade themselves at home with groceries for one month, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. or they go out to demonstrate against the violence. So this is a flight or fight response. Mm. And it has to do with the fact that the situation becomes less and less predictable as it as it drags on that is why early intervention and forceful intervention and visible ostentatious intervention is utterly crucial because ah. the long the longer this goes on the more irreversible the damages are and there are even situations where communities have never recovered Yes, Never. yes. And uh, it's interesting you, you it's interesting you say that with Keir Starmer because uh, you know the televising of the sentencing the very visual uh, justice being seen to be done um very swift, you know, not a lot of time between somebody and also the releasing of the body cam and what have you. And, and it's interesting uh, we talked about this before with the previous guest that when they've televised or when they've reported and uh, you know on this very swift a uh, very visual form of justice that is it a message I, I feel it's a message where if you saw this huge mob of, you know from the villagers point of view this frightening mass changing your community you see them one by one these big monsters bursting into tears in the dock uh, you know crying for their mummies um you, you find out they've got a string of convictions all of those things, it turns the mob into individuals. It makes, I don't know, who were seen to be monsters, you can then say, oh, they're actually human. <laughs> it restores perspective and, and proportion. And it is a signal of zero tolerance. Mm. And in such occurrences, such events, zero, zero tolerance is the only form of tolerance allowed. You, we should never tolerate violence, not even minimally. No. The invisible invisible class has justified grievances. And it is to the discredit of the authorities, governments, NGOs, civil society, and the elites, that they've been ignoring these grievances for so long, economic grievances, spiritual grievances, community grievances, and so on. That is to their discredit. 
that they've been ignoring it. But violence is should be utterly outlawed and and avoided as a mode of communication. There are other ways to communicate. Violence should never be one of them. Okay. So zero tolerance, ostentatious punishment, grave, severe, harsh punishment. The exposure of the backgrounds of outside agitators and mm, mm. and hi hijackers of the process and hitchhikers on the process <laughs> and so on and so forth. And if if uh, necessary, an, a concerted effort to reconstruct the community. Mm. Much too often, in the wake of such in the wake of such episodes, the communities are left to fend off on their own and for their own. I mean, they're just just left behind. They're, that's it. The news cycle. The news cycle has moved on. Oh, no yeah. one cares. And, and we're going to talk more about that and what hap has what we've seen. Um, you know, builders coming out and and rebuilding walls and uh, general public coming out to clean the streets and what have you. And I think. That is fairly new as well. And Sam, you've touched upon uh, new and different things that we're seeing. We'll be back with more with Sam right after this break. Welcome back. I'm with Sam Vaknin, uh, um, psychologist, geopolitical analyst. And we're having a real deep down look because all you get in the newspapers at uh, the very best, like, not all of them, but you get the headlines and you, what have you. Um, and I like looking at the different layers and making you think because the world isn't like Star Wars with the goodies and baddies. It's it's uh, far more nuanced than that. Sam uh, is still with us. Sam, we, we talked about what witnessing such violence does to communities one of the things that especially and and, and I, I mentioned earlier in the program many many people doctors nurses dentists street you know people who sell um you know have the corner store whoever have felt very scared and very unsafe because you and you hit upon it you you uh people like myself people, all of these people a friend of mine is a very respected gp heart surgeon whatever we just think of ourselves as brits yeah here we are we're just british we don't think of ourselves uh as uh, our color until something or someone makes an issue of it and suddenly you become very uh, and you hit upon it very well 
very unsure. The place where I grew up, you know, you know, 1957, I've, you know, all of these places. And suddenly you're being told by people who haven't spent half as long in the country <laughs> that because you're brown, even though you were born there, even you paid your taxes there, even though your mother was asked to come desperately, you know, after the war as part of the nurses, suddenly you're other and you're unsafe because nobody's going to check with you they're just going to see your color and go for you or as in my husband's case if he's he's jewish somebody's going to go for him purely because of something we don't go around and you know we're just us and we're proud of being where where we are and we love where we are and suddenly we were other when people in their thousands came out into the street and 99.9 percent .9 very peacefully said you are welcome here and you look at them and they're women and children. There's an elderly lady, uh, I think Nan's Against Fascism in the 90s or something like that. When you get an imam giving bread and food to a rioter and hugging them um, and talking with them, uh, when you see all of that, it restores your faith in, hum uh, in humanity. But you kind of ask, wow, Where's that come from? Who are these people that they are brave enough because it's pretty scary and they thought all of those, you know, the people we've been talking about would be out there. Who are they to get out of their comfortable living rooms, uh, most of them are white, and say, no, we're not like that. I think that takes bravery. I mean, people like myself have got no choice. <laughs> you know, if we encounter a mob like that, um, they're going to beat us up and maybe ask questions later. These people have a choice, and yet women, children, elderly ladies in their 80s, people who fought in the war, people who experienced, uh, or parents who experienced the Holocaust, uh, people from all sorts of life come out and, as far as they know, could be risking their safety, but to stand in their thousands and say, no, no more. How, how does that come about? A vision of the future. If you leave these, if you leave these violent demonstrators to their own devices, they're going to shape the country. Mm. They're going to shape the country in their own image. It's the same goes in the, for the United States. Yes. If you leave, if you leave the Trump base to shape the United States, it's going to look like Trump. Do you want the United States to look like Trump? Do you like, Do you want the United Kingdom to look like these rioters? And then I think this is far more frightening than confronting the rioters and confronting the Trump base or confronting anyone for that mm, matter. Mm, mm. I think it is this vision of a dystopian, terrifying, surrealistic future that is driving these people to preserve the present mm. and to avoid this transition via means of violence, to avoid this transition to a future that is inhuman in, in many ways. And that is terrorizing. Mm. Uh, 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 oh, it, it, I was going to say, so so what makes somebody decide, or what makes people decide uh, to peacefully demonstrate that it doesn't have to be that way? Depends how invested you are in your community, in your country, in your nation, in your... Mm. The more you're invested, then the more likely you are to protest and to to put to establish a wall a firewall between you and the the future that these violent people are driving at same applies not only to violent protestations same applies to demagogues mm. same applies to authoritarian figures same applies to anyone who is driving the community or the community at large the nation country nation state you have any collective, anyone who's driving a collective towards a vision of suppression and ugliness and, and you know, oppression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chaos. They should be opposed. They should be opposed. Now, there's one thing I think that we, we tend to a bit overlook, not totally, but or, or at least not look at it rightly. They, if these events constitute a trauma. Yeah. This is a trauma. And the communities and the country at large, not only the community, because we, we tend to, to limit our attention, focus our attention on the those who are directly involved and directly affected. Mm. That is wrong. The entire country is traumatized. 
This yes. is a national trauma. Yes. And so we need to use, we need to apply techniques borrowed from trauma therapy. And we need to apply them to individuals who have been directly impacted by the violence. And we need to apply them to the communities. So on a community level, like a community level trauma therapy, mm. and we need to apply them on, apply it on the national level. That's a good point. Now, solidarity, these marches, you know, mm. solidarity is a good start, but it's only a start mm. and it doesn't tackle the core after effects of, of the trauma. The trauma is there. Yes. Make no mistake about it. It has to be tackled. And I think the fact that we don't mobilize psychologists, we don't have a psychologist mobilization force, so to speak, an mm. army of psychology mm. at the ready, at the ready is a deficiency because modern life, modern life throws at us traumas much more frequently mm. than before. Yeah. Yeah. This is comparable, comparable maybe to the twenties and thirties, nineteen mm. twenties, nineteen thirties. And we need to be equipped because people get traumatized and then they never recover. Even if they appear to have recovered, they actually did not recover. And this says this reverberates, this reverberates and then gets multiplied. And we need to put a stop to it on each and every level, national, community, individual, family, individual. I couldn't agree. We've got, we've got to end it there, and I couldn't agree with you more. And that's why I cheered the King's message in, um, you know, recognising and speaking to and congratulating. I think to be, uh, you know, your your bravery or your you, you know communities coming together, those people who build the walls, who hand out the bread, who do all of those things, being recognised and uh, congratulated, I think is a first step, just one of many steps. Sam, it has been, as usual, brilliant, Thank brilliant uh, talking with you. Um, and I'm, as I keep saying on my show, I'm very, very lucky to have guests like yourself from whom I learn and who I listen. And I can see from the messages um, as well. Rachel, who, who sent a message in, Thank you. I thank you. Um, I'm so pleased and I'm very fortunate that I can bring you uh, voices that make you think outside the usual rah, rah, rah. <laughs> you know what I'm about mind, body and soul uh, in a moment we're going to change